Welcome to the transfer pricing course number one, week one, spring 2020, video on arm's length historical cases. I am Professor William Burns at Texas A&M University School of Law. Howdy! So, thank you for joining me for this third uh, canned video lecture of the week. Um, at this time, you've had the opportunity to review both my video lectures, which are an introduction to this course, an introduction to transfer pricing and valuation methods that are just in general to accounting. And you've had an opportunity to review the canned video lectures that map up to the case study um, that Bruno De Silva um, will be leading this week. In your folder under the eCampus, I've placed in a series of cases that are uh, I put under the uh, title Discerning the Arm's Length Standard. It's not that these series of cases are, you know, well, they're historical, so they're not current in the sense of, um, you know, something you might be cite, citing in your practice. Um, however, having said that, you know, you do find, um, you, you know, quite to my surprise, in the recent uh, Altira decision, um, I call it a zombie case. Uh, and we'll, we'll see it in the slides. Um, this case called Frank, and uh, which, as we'll see in the slides, is kind of an anomaly case. Such an anomaly case that the Ninth Circuit that originally decided Frank um, also decided in Frank, but also in other cases, that Frank was really an anomaly. And out of the blue, another Ninth Circuit panel, decades later, pulls it out as a show of strength in support of their finding against the taxpayer in Altira. And it had been, it was just such an off the wall, or as, as, I, as I say, a zombie um, case uh, that, you know, they brought back to life by citing it in the, uh, in the Altira decision. So uh, with no further ado, let's start with oil base. Now, the purpose of these slides is not to go through and analyze each of the cases. I'm merely really pulling out of the case the critical information from the case. You don't even have to read the case if you don't want to. As I said, it wasn't required reading. I, I think it's very interesting and historical reading. I think it will help people who aren't involved with transfer pricing to, well, as the title is, discern the arm's length standard, but to to understand how judges grapple with transfer pricing cases, and, and in particular with this like arm's length standard, and uh, so in the uh, in the oil base case of 1964, um, I give you this introduction. The pre 1960s, the courts view transactions based on a variety of lenses, including fair and reasonable, full fair value, fair and reasonable in the trade. Now, I, I mean, I could put another slide pack together on pre-1960 cases going all the way back. I think that uh, when I teach this residentially, I did make the students suffer through that, but they're, they're just law students. And they'll have the experience to do some of the more complicated case studies that we're going to do. So, you know, we focused on these, like, I think there was a 1920s. Yeah, I think it goes all the way back to 1920s before they even had the arm's length um, written into the uh, regulation, which I think came in 1935. So, uh, and then we have a, a many cases uh, leading up to the 1960s where the courts and frankly the Treasury is struggling with uh, what is this Section 482? What is this allocation um, to reflect, you know, actual or real income mean? So, different standards, fair and reasonable, full fair value fair and reasonable in the trade. These were the, the standards used to justify 
um, by the U.S. Treasury when they were doing audits, but by the courts of why the Treasury was right or why that an adjustment had to be made to a taxpayer's reported income, you know, usually an upwards adjustment, and uh, thus bringing, you know, incurring more tax for the taxpayer. And that upward adjustment of income in these cases had to come from their foreign activities. And uh, so in this oil-based case, the judge states, it is unnecessary for us to decide whether the sole standard in the cases under 42 is one of an amount which would be arrived at in an arm's length transactions between unrelated parties. The reason I'm really accentuating stating that sentence, here the judge is stating, 1964, arm's length, which is in the regulations at this point for 30 years, the arm's length standard in our, in our 482 dash one regulation. So right up front in the regulations, you must use arm's length. Here the judge is stating, it's unnecessary for us to decide whether arm's length is actually, you know, it's a standard. They're saying it's a standard because it's whether it's the sole standard, that's the key. Whether arm's length can be ignored, that's what this sentence says. And who would be the one ignoring it? Well, generally speaking, it's gonna be the treasury the IRS, um, when they want to increase the income on the U.S. taxpayer side. So, and again, that may, you know, we have three different potential standards uh, up above. Fair and reasonable, full fair value, fair and reasonable in the trade. So the court continues in that paragraph. The commissioner has been given much latitude in the use of Section 482 when necessary to prevent the evasion of federal income tax by shifting of profits between taxpayers subject to common control. I think that it's undeniable when you read Section 482 uh, that, and if you forget what that means for the for the non-U.S. students, you know, go back and look at the uh, previous. Uh, video can lectures um, by me for this week. But uh, I think it's obvious when reading it that it does correctly give much latitude for the use of, you know, when necessary to prevent. On the other hand, that latitude has been defined and I would say restricted by the U.S. Treasury itself in, in stating that the arm's length standard is the standard to be applied to determine if the income realized by the U.S. party um, is the income or the price for uh, for goods is the is the price that would be paid for the goods or price for services is the price that would be paid for services if the U.S. party was transacting with the foreign party as if it was a third party instead of a subsidiary. So oil base continues. There is no evidence to show that the percentage return obtained retained by petitioner on domestic sales would represent a reasonable return on its export sales. So this sentence tells us about the case. There's no evidence. So this is a comparability of the percentage return to other third parties. What those third parties would have received as a percentage return on their um, on, its, on their export sales. And that percentage return in this case is defined as reasonable return. Notice that there's no mention 
of a arm's length standard return. There's no mention at this point, and you'll see it's not mentioned uh, in the next paragraph either that you've read, um, that there's no mention of a, uh, a comparison to third parties on whether the transaction um, is within a range. So it's nothing that we know about today. It doesn't reflect well, most of what we uh, understand today for the uh, determination of transfer pricing value through methods. Uh, this, is, this is interesting also in that it's, it's kind of foreshadowing the comparison of the, well, comparable profits method. And you'll say, you're, you're really reading into this one, Barnes. <laughs> um, but I, I'm not saying the judge was an economist. And, you know, as an economist was thinking about something in the future where they would compare profits um, of companies versus, some, you know, like, like-minded companies or subsidiaries versus like-minded subsidiaries or what have you. Um, because what this does show is that the judge is struggling with intuitive concepts of how do I determine if the income relaxes? This isn't about a price at this stage. It's about an income, the percentage return. How do I determine if the percentage return, you know, reflects the, you know, the actual income? Well, reflects it against what that should be, this normative should be received. And so the judge's understanding of this should be received has to be reflected reflected against um, the, the standard, the should, <laughs> and the standard the judge has pulled out of, uh, out of the hat from the previous cases before 1960s is, uh, is uh, you're going to see fair and reasonable, but reasonable return. So reasonable return has to be you know, conjured from, from something, and, it, and so conjuring it from you know, comparable not that they use that word at all, but con conjuring it from other companies that have export sales. So in our next sentence, this is likewise, there is likewise no evidence to show that the amount of commissions and discounts paid to oil-based Venezuela represented a reasonable amount, comma, a fair amount. <laughs> so in, I've highlighted these in bright red, right? A reasonable amount a fair amount or an amount which would meet any other criteria. This sentence tells me that there are now three standards, at least, for this judge. A reasonable amount standard, a fair amount standard, or other standards. That's the or an amount which would meet any other criteria, so that could be arm's length standard or anything else the judge were to conjure up for this case, or the treasury was to put forward, or taxpayer. And then finally, certainly the facts that these commissions are almost double those paid by petitioner to unrelated persons in arm's length transactions is evidence they were not fair and reasonable. So now we have a cup standard um, or a cup method, sorry, being applied uh, to the uh, to determine whether the uh, the valuation of this transaction or tr a series of transactions on the exports are uh, you know reflect a reasonable or, or sorry reflect an actual uh, income or reflect the you know true income. So certainly the fact that these commissions are almost double. So certainly, the judge is saying, of course you have to consider, and consider what? The cup standard, i.e., we have oil-based United States exporting and trading with unrelated parties. And so there's our benchmark valuation standard. And the judge says, those are arm's length. That's unrelated parties. And because oil-based United States isn't using the same commission amount, in fact, is using almost double 
that's evidence that, and then he combines the two paragraphs above. That's evidence they were not fair and reasonable. Because he uses the word and, now this isn't statutory construction, this is a judge, but regardless, the judge understands legal language and construction. And because he uses the word and, this judge is now stating, you have to both meet, you have to meet both of these standards the judge has created, not created, he's pulled them from previous cases, previous pre-1960s, but you have to meet a fair standard and a reasonable standard. And the way to meet those standards is one way is a reasonable amount. Another way is a fair amount. <laughs> That's the paragraph before. Another way is to compare um, the transaction versus other transactions that the U.S. party has with unrelated in arm's length. That's the uh, immediate sentence before fair and reasonable. So, I mean, this case you could have just, you know, glanced over and been like, oh, this is a simple case. Actually, when we really dig into it, this judge is making pronouncements that if we're followed, um, our transfer pricing today would look radically different. And it would be much more, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, we have a lot of litigation controversy and, uh, and that's all good. We want his transfer pricing for transfer pricing to be, I tell this to my first year tax students, of course, opaque, uncertain, changing, complicated or complex, because that's what makes, you know, tax advisors dollars and tax advisors can't make dollars if there's not a tax revenue authority on the other side challenging because when there's I've been in I literally have been in countries where there's no tax authority or the tax authorities uh, you know corrupt and uh, and then you don't really need to pay your tax advisor in fact if you pay anybody you pay the tax authority a bribe in the corrupt countries but where there's no tax advisor they're really not doing you know audits or so forth response is what do I need you for <laughs> so if I get caught you know, I know I'm not being compliant, but if I go out, okay, I'll just pay, you know, the little bit of tax because they're not really doing an audit. And uh, so tax advisors have a hard time. Anyway, let's move on to Johnson Bronze. So Johnson Bronze, a year later, 1965, a different court. And in Johnson Bronze, we have this statement. Taxpayers owned or controlled by the same interests. So that's our connected parties, controlled parties. Um, may enter into transactions inter se. So, of, of course they have to enter into transactions. <laughs> that's integration of a group. That's, that's how we understand um, managerial economics. They, they are, uh, that's, you know, it's a fact of life. We have vertically and horizontally integrated uh, companies. So, uh, but the transactions must be, and if fair, so he's pulled one of the standards of our previous oil-based case, not both, not the reasonable standard, just the fair one. So, and if fair, then, or resulting from an arm's length bargaining. So here the judge has given us two different methods to determine whether um, the transaction reflects um, you know, true income. This is the fair standard in red or an arm's length bargaining standard um, that I didn't highlight. Such transactions will be undisturbed. Undisturbed because they meet uh, section 42's, uh, they reflect income, the, uh, the true income. So then our next slide is also Johnson Broad's where we, where the judge uh, states consequently now, this is a total, you know, change from the immediate sentence. The standard to be applied in every case is that of an uncontrolled taxpayer dealing at arm's length with another uncontrolled taxpayer. So here you have, let's apply the arm's length standard 
in every case, I should have highlighted in every, just to really bring it home, in every case. I'm just gonna go back, because here, you can enter the transaction if it's fair, or arm's length. Either one is okay with that construction using the word or. Here, you must use uncontrolled taxpayers. In this paragraph, the judge tells us, an uncontrolled taxpayer dealing at arm's length with petitioner would not have, without being compensated, performed the business services. Then the judge says, we believe that because a petitioner performed services above and beyond the mere manufacturer of goods, it would have demanded a fixed fee or a share of the profits. The question is, what share of the profits or what price for its goods would petitioner have demanded and received if it had been dealing with a stranger, with a third party? So here the judge is, and then this is going to be like one of my last slides of this deck is judges as alchemists, judges as economists, discerners, um, but they're not obviously trained in that. Um, and so here we have the judge alluding or foreshadowing my last slide, but stating, you know what, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to figure out what the share of profits or what the price for goods would be under the arm's length because it's not really being presented to me. And in our final slide for Johnson Bronze, this is that Frank case I mentioned when I started the lecture, like the zombie case. So the judge cites Frank, 1962 case. There was a discussion by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals concerning whether the intergroup dealings must be reasonable or at arm's length. So these are clearly two different methods, two different standards of which to evaluate whether the income is, the, uh, is reflected of true income, reasonable or arm's length. Mind you, if I go back two slides, we see that the judge says fair or arm's length. So he's citing the Frank case here. And, if, you know, it's not to mince words. And I'm sure this judge probably isn't even alive anymore. But it's not to mince words. But, you know, judges, what they write, you know, does you know, become the effect of the law. And so what they write and how they write it is like statutory construction. And so this case itself, Johnson Bronze is confused. The judge cites a fair or arm's length, two slides back, a couple paragraphs back before this one. And here states, citing Frank, reasonable or at arm's length, you don't see the fair valuation method or standard of which to evaluate a transaction. Um, you know, mentioned. So on this subject, we shall say only that on the facts of this case, and now we have the only reasonable price would be one which would have been arrived at arm's length. So now the judge is using reasonable as if that is the benchmark and arm's length is the valuation method, but reasonable is the benchmark that is to be um, determined. It's the point is that there's a lot of different messages in each of these paragraphs that are not congruent with the previous paragraph. And you can read it all together. It's just being, well, everything applies. It's all just one big maloo. Yes, it's chaos theory. Whatever happens that day happens. And, uh, and it will be different and unknown. And, well, that's not really what courts are supposed to do, though. <laughs> They're supposed to, you know, at least theoretically, courts are supposed to 
you know, work certainty into the system and, uh, and reliability on the courts. But uh, um, it's to be fair, though, the judges are economists and they're being asked to to decide economic questions. Which moves us to Lufkin Foundry. Here in 1972, the parties do not dispute the general proposition that Lufkin was required to present evidence sufficient to establish that the discounts and commissions it gave would not have varied from one controlled taxpayer at an arm's length with another. So, this judge is saying, Neither side, so both the Treasury and the taxpayer agree that you have to look at um, arm's length standard. Then the judge says, but Lufkin, the taxpayer, wanted to present an other method. Lufkin contends it's possible to comply with the requirements by producing and analyzing evidence of its own marketing arrangements. Now, is that marketing arrangements still a cup like taxpayer to third party or is it taxpayer to taxpayer in another context we don't know yet so we read on the commissioner argues that such a taxpayer must produce some probative evidence of unrelated and uncontrolled companies um, so the commission says well you have to have third parties dealing with each other so is this a question of taxpayer to arm's length uh, transaction third party and that's being the Treasury saying no that's not allowed you have to look at two third parties dealing with each other is that it or is the taxpayer arguing that they should be allowed to present evidence of what they do within uh, their other group <laughs> with the, the transactions with other group members and so in our final slide of Lufkin, although these subsections are, and I just love this, uh, this sentence, so I have to include it in my slides. Although these subsections are too prolix to warrant explication in this opinion, he's referring to the regulations. And in 1968, Treasury had promulgated new transfer pricing regulations with the original, like, uh, you know, cup method and cost plus method and resale minus method. There was no comparable profits method at that time, not yet. And, um, and so, the, but the judge says, I, I can't read all those. I can't read all those pages. I mean, does he literally say that? He says, well, maybe I read them, but they're too prolix, which is like, gosh, I don't even remember that word growing up in English. So I had to go look it up, you know, but it's another way of saying there's just too many words and they're too complicated to warrant explication to warrant me to even try to explain it to you in this opinion. So a careful reading of those regulations demonstrates that evidence of transactions by uncontrolled parties um, must be presented. You must present uh, third party evidence. But what it doesn't tell us, so you're gonna have to read the case yourself and go you know, more in depth if you wanna try and discern, what it doesn't tell us is can taxpayers present evidence between taxpayer and third parties? Or does it just have to be third parties? So in our Baldwin case, 1970, we have um, Austin Western, that's the subsidiary of Baldwin, Lima Hamilton. So Austin Western makes big equipment. That's AW in the United States. You have AWH, which is the foreign company, and this is like Puerto Rican cases. Um, what's that mean? So the United States Congress set up an export incentive regime. This is, so WH stands for Western Hemisphere. And if an American company established a subsidiary in a Western Hemisphere country, so-called the Caribbean, you know, and, and they really wanted Puerto Rico, they're trying to build up the economy of Puerto Rico. If an American company did that, then you would have a reduction in your taxes. But they didn't give you 
by example, well, you pay you know, 35 percent corporate rate in the United States, you only have to pay 30 percent in Puerto Rico. They use like, well, we'll, we'll allow you to overpay um, or underpay or over, you know, for goods or overpay or underpay for service that we allow you in the regulation to reduce the income um, from the uh, uh, from the transactions to achieve basically a certain tax rate. But we don't want to actually tell you what that tax rate is in the legislation. And one could, in the world of international tax and global comparative tax, you know, state that the United States is playing games with other countries. Look, our tax rate is 35%. But what we don't tell you is that we have, we play with our tax base, we play with tax credits, we play with arm's length pricing to, to reduce the effective tax rate, but only on export. So this is a, a, subs, a tax subsidy for exporting. And you know you're not supposed to, you're not allowed to do that under the what's now called the World Trade Organization, but back then was the uh, GATT, the GATT, right? So um, so anyway, the but the Treasury says IRS says, hey, wait, you're taking too much. Congress meant for you to take X, but you're taking X plus Y. Okay, so then you know, the, and then the taxpayers in sense like, well, Congress wrote the rule, and we're allowed to take you know this is to give us a tax incentive. To uh, export, and and you know, and Treasury says, yeah, but you still have to pay some tax. Okay. So in our case, we have lots of percentages, but let me just uh, explain them briefly so you can see what the judge is looking at. For the judge to say, wait a second, this can't be right. So in year one, two, and three, that's the first. The first row is year one. Second row is year two. Third row is year three. Our American subsidiary, Austin Western, has 11.9% profit margin. The, 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 I'm just going to call it Puerto Rico. The Puerto Rico subsidiary has 12.9. Okay, they're you know, not the same, but within range. The second year, it's the same, 8.5, 9.5. Okay, I mean, still, you know, the foreign one you know, has a percent more. You know, it doesn't seem to be, you know, really the U.S. company seems to be an important one, but you know, so why is the foreign one getting more? That's a legitimate question, but it's an export regime and, you know, Congress intended to give them a tax break. Now we get to year three. Wait a second. The American company only has 2.5% profit margin and the foreign company's profit margin actually went up 9.8%. Now what's in the middle column? That's the consolidated. Now when you look at it consolidated, it's a quite a different story. The whole group's profit margin for year one is 2.1%. So you have foreign company, or foreign Puerto Rican, so U.S. territory company, 12.9%. And you have, um, and you have uh, the, the group profit margin at 2.1%. The reason I put the different columns, this is 1970, it's a very early case still, but it's what are you benchmarking against internally if you're using, by example, the comparable profits method? Now, there was no comparable profits method at this time. But isn't what the judge is doing comparing profits? Isn't this the comparable profits method before there's a comparable profits method? So we saw in the you know early 60s cases, the judge is foreshadowing this exact experiment. Now, I'm not the judge didn't come up with these numbers. These are presented in the case. These are presented, obviously, by the taxpayer and revenue. But what do you compare the tested party against? Is the tested party AWH? That's, and I, I don't even know if it's Puerto Rico. I didn't go. It's just, it's a Western Hemisphere company, so I assume Puerto Rico. Is it is it, uh, it could be Bahamas, by example, back then. Um, is it, uh, is it the U.S. subsidiary? It's not the consolidated group, because that's, that's not a taxpayer. That's, uh, it is, federally speaking, but it's, um, it's, it's not an actual entity. So, um, 
But actually, for my purpose of just explaining these numbers, it doesn't matter, although it does matter from, from who's being audited point of view. But from my point, it doesn't matter because the consolidated group numbers are so different. So whether I test American company or um, AWH, 11.9 manufacturer, 12.9 distributor, 2.1 consolidated group. Both of them seem to be like, how is this possible? Because there must be other group members with losses or something. But also then, if I'm if I'm testing my AWH, the distributor, and saying, well, what value are you actually, you know, what are you doing? What are you getting paid for? Services, building up markets, services like you know logistics, services like sales teams. And if you read the case, you'll see all that explained and um, what they are doing and not doing. But uh, and relative to what other third-party distributors do for the company. Um, so you say, wait a second, 2.1% group margin, they do everything, 12.9% for much less services. Anyway, you can see the judge is like, I'm concerned. And uh, especially when you see the last row, 2.5% on the American side, 3.2% on the group side, but 9.8, which is actually an increase on the uh, on the foreign side, so the judge is like, this doesn't look right. The optics are not good, taxpayer. And then, then the judge quotes, <laughs> "The evil." <laughs> so, which side? What perspective does the judge come at this case from? And in my uh, first set of slides of this week, you'll see, uh, you know, I talk about perspectives, and I had my little globe, spinning globe. <laughs> the evil. I should have highlighted that in red with like smoky, uh, with red flames coming out of it. To which 482 addresses itself is the improper milking of one business for the benefit of the other. So, uh, so instead of like, you know, 482 addresses the phenomena of intergroup prices and, you know, might, might they be tilted toward one side or, you know, not reflect income or, you know, there are many other ways of looking at that, um, but this judge, you know, it's black or white, you know, it's a one zero <laughs> evil. You're an evil do-gooder or you're on the side of, you know, justice. Which brings us to uh, the test which the commissioner followed is whether the controlled taxpayers would have realized the same income had they conducted them at arm's length. And uh, so the judge is saying, um, Let's now, if we go back to the previous slide, we're testing it not against arm's length, we're testing it internally. In, you know, internally, um, and then if we go back to our previous slide deck on valuation methods, and uh, we saw you could look at, you know, compare internal comparisons uh, for valuation, external comparisons for valuation for financial accounting. And, uh, and so the judge is, uh, you know, in or when the judge is quoting the facts and the profit margins, that's an intrinsic. But here he's saying, well, you know, what we got to look at. So what happened? The intrinsic is the optics. The judge is like, something's not right here. And because something's not right, instead of looking at the, you know, the arm's length standard up front, meaning, well, against third parties, this price is out of, out of whack. Internally, he's saying the profit margins are out of whack. So the judges applied, he applied the comparable profits method, regard, although he doesn't state it. But he says, in the optics of the comparable profits method, now we've got to go find out what the right price should be. And then the judge walks through, I have a couple more slides on this, just because this is going to get to my slide about the judge is an alchemist. Now the judge starts to like, well, looking at this, looking at that. So the regular discount, distributor discount of 22% was given to um, the foreign company when it was entitled only to 17.5%. The 22 is class A. Okay, so the judge is like going through and doing the comparison in the case. Um, 
since AWH, that's the foreign company, um, is not allowed to have the Class A distributor full discount of 22.5, its costs would have been higher and its profits lower. And that will shift income to the U.S. taxpayer to accomplish um, uh, what the Treasury is seeking here. Then the judge states, just look back at Class A distributor in the middle of the paragraph. Class A distributors possess financial strength and stocking of other parts, repair parts. AWH fails to, fails to meet Class A distributorship because its only capitalization is $5,000 and it did not stock parts. It doesn't have financial strength. This is going to, you know, fast forward to today. And these are the questions that the OECD has interjected into valuation. And they should have always been there. But regardless, that they are specifically now interjected into, through the BEPS project, into the transfer pricing guidelines. You know, what's the financial strength of the parties relative to each other? Can, can in, in, if you're looking at arm's length pricing of financial transactions, interest rates and so forth, does, does the party that's, you know, claiming to bear risk, does it have the financial strength to bear the risk? Okay, so next slide. Our foreign pump, foreign company, AWH, was also given the prop payment discount. And uh, so, you know, that's normal, the previous discount, and you're going to see another slide about another discount, but these are the typical discounts that apply in third party transactions. And internally, Austin Western applied them to its own transactions. And the judge is stating, well, in the third parties, and this is getting to the comparable. The judge is doing the correct analysis, as we understand it, in transfer pricing. He's looking at the parties, and he is evaluating the parties' comparability or comparable to each other by looking at their functions, their risks, you know, the financial strength, and so he's he's taking the this the tested party is AWH, and he's comparing it, each of its facets for the different discounts, but each of its facets against what the independent distributors' facets are. So they're given a discount for prompt payment if they paid 10th of the month following the date of invoice. But when I, the judge, looked at AWH, it paid its bills only on 20 of the 36 occasions on this 10th of the month. So it's not exactly the best, you know, if this was third parties, about half, half the time you pay on time. The other half, you know, I got to call you and harass and say, hey, where's my payment? I haven't got my payment yet. Do you want, you know, I'm not going to ship any more goods. So you sent me my payment, but they don't have to do that because it's their subsidiary. <laughs> so, um, so they're saying you can't give a prompt payment discount when, uh, when, the compar comparably, AWH is not acting um, as if uh, like it's in these third party distributors act. Finally, we talk about the selling and advertising expense discount. That doesn't take into account AW participated in the actual advertising. So AW didn't necessarily advertise on behalf of its other third party distributors and yada yada. So then we see this other quantity and middleman discount. Uh, if you look at the uh, bottom of the paragraph, okay. So last slide on on uh, on Austin Western, but it's, the case is called Baldwin Lima Hamilton. Taxpayer argues that if the uh, if the Puerto Rican subsidiary were not given the discounts, it could make no profit. In a case where the Puerto Rican distributors would be entitled to discounts, but ADWH itself would not be. So it's stating 
hey, our foreign subsidiary that's supposed to get export incentives, it has to offer these discounts to the people it distributes to. Because in essence, we just set it up as an intermediary to take advantage of the export incentive regime. We well, doesn't need to be there. We don't need it. We're just taking advantage of Congress's export tax subsidy regime. We still have to offer the discounts that were offered previously. So if we can't offer U.S. to intermediary the discounts, and intermediary to actual distributors have to offer the discounts, well, then the intermediary is going to be at a loss. And if it's at a loss, wait, how do we get a tax advantage again? Where's our incentive to export under this regime? Okay, so a, the foreign company would actually be buying from the U.S. company at a price higher than it had to sell to distributors. And no third party would do that. Says, um, says Austin Western. Then the judge says, after the judges looked at profit margins in our first, uh, second slide with all the optics, then the judge says this in, in red bold, oh, but the fact that it would make no profit into consideration the arm's length test. So correctly, the judge does say, you know, we have to look at the transactions. But the only reason we're looking at the transactions, I mean, not the only reason, it's the correct thing we're supposed to do, but the only, but from the judge's point of view, the reason we're looking at them is because he looked at the profits. <laughs> he said, what's the profit margin of AWH? What's the profit margin of AW? What's the profit margin of the group? Something's not right here. Well, don't look at that and then state, oh, oh but that, and that shouldn't be a consideration. I can, I can make it work. I can say, well, we, we, you know, as a risk assessment tool to determine whether we need to audit, we need to look at the profit margins, but they're not relevant to whether the profit margin, I'm sorry, relevant to whether the transactions are correct or not. You can make it work together like that. And one could argue that in today's terms, the country by country reports, that's what they do. They help you assess risk, but they don't actually tell you whether the underlying transactions are at arm's length or not. They just give you the optics of whether to decide whether to look at them. And that brings us to Ross Club, 1973. The one quote I wanted to pull out for you is, we therefore are presented in a situation in which neither the respondent's determination nor the petitioner's price accurately reflects the arm's length price. So Ross Glove, the judge, says the Treasury and the taxpayer are both presenting such one-sided stories or stories with such problems in the evaluation methods or the implementation of the evaluation methods that I, the judge, okay, and here's my next Ross Glove slide, but it gets me to the slide. I wanted to show you the alchemist, judge's alchemist. Under such circumstances, the duty to find an arm's length price rests with the court. So I, the judge, am forced to go through the valuation method, even though I'm not an economist. So if I'm not an economist, I'm an alchemist. <laughs> and uh, I have to go through, and I'm going to determine, and then we get to every single split the baby, as we call them colloquially, in transfer pricing cases, you get to all the pharma cases. Oh, both sides are wrong. Let me cut it in half. The judge doesn't say cut it in half. It just happens to be, you know, about a halfway point. And we see it in other transfer pricing cases. In Medtronics, it turns out, um, you know, it's about half of what each side was asking. But that's because in that one, it's the half of what each side was asking actually reflects what their original agreement, their original, it wasn't in you know, kind of an advanced pricing agreement. It was kind of because it was actually a settlement agreement of an original audit. But, uh, you know, the judge, you know, got him back to that place by, you know, basically cutting it in half. And um, and uh, then the, the, the appellate circuit sent it back to the judge and said, well, you didn't do enough analysis and explanation of why you chose half. I don't know why they just, you know, make life easy and actually just call the standard what it is, split the baby. 
I split the baby in half. <laughs> and then you wouldn't get it sent back because because uh, the standard is, you know, I have to add it up and cut it in half. But anyway, considering all the evidence and bearing heavily on the respondent, we find the price should be reduced by 20%. So if you read through Ross Glove, and Ross Glove has a lot of really good, um, you know, explanation about pricing and, and, and how the glove market works, textiles market, a lot of good information. And um, so I, the reason I would encourage you to read the cases or the longer cases is because they do have a lot of supply chain explanation and, and pricing information and, uh, and optics, like with our uh, previous case, um, the uh, Western, uh, the construction manufacturer. Um, so anyway, by the, when we reach Ross Glove, we, f we find um, what happens since. I, the judge, am presented with two very different opinions, the taxpayer and the treasury. Neither of them makes sense to me. If I was using the baseball arbitration um, in these cases, in baseball arbitration, each side is allowed to present one solution, one price. That's how it works in baseball arbitration. And the arbitrator decides which one is, in essence, closest to the middle. But which one is, the of the two, which choice is the best, given the strengths of each side's arguments? Not which side is right or wrong, but which side gets closest to a mediation between the two. And so in game theory, if you want to win it, you should, you know, inch closer toward the center of the two. And it would, you know, incentivizes both sides to get there. And so, I mean, technically their offer should be the exact same, but that's mediation in general. And it's not because that's why you have a conflict, but, uh, but they should be in a much more closer range than just, you know, before the dispute is a dispute. They're coming at it from these very, very different perspectives, very different. So the judge here is stating, you, both of y'all are way off. You're not even close. And so you forced me to do it. In this case, it was like, well, I'll reduce it by 20% alchemy. And that's the answer. So that finishes this uh, presentation. Thank you kindly for your time. And we're going to see you in class on, uh, on Sunday this week. And then remember, the immediate following Monday, at 8 a.m. We're starting with Dr. Lorraine Eden. So thank you very kindly for your time.